Well, the very first thing is to say uh, welcome to Dan McTeague. How are you doing? I'm doing fine, Rex. Thanks for having me. Well, on your subject, the subject you've made yourself a professional at, it was gas prices originally, and now it's the more general concerns of the non-energy policy of our great country. Uh, let me just start somewhere. Let's go with Keystone. Within less than 24 hours, an American president canceled the only possible uh, escape of Alberta's energy to other, other particular markets. And apart from the news of probably half a day, we haven't heard anything since. I mean, where does it come that a national government sees a province being strangulated and, the, and an American president ideologically aligned with it uh, puts this damage out so quickly and off we go, no, no big deal? Because it's all political. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with reality. The fact that this particular pipeline is very much needed by American refiners, by the American people. Let's put it in context. I mean, the American people have to understand, and I think they understand full well, most of the refineries in the U.S. Midwest and the Gulf Coast have reconfigured to accepting heavier oil. And unfortunately, Venezuela, Mexico, uh, Iran, uh, even Saudi Arabia are simply not, for a variety of reasons, selling in more oil to the United States. So, if they're not getting it from their usual customers, where are they going to supplement? Where are they going to be able to run their economy? So they need it. But the reality is that this was really, uh, you know, I mean, this was really more of a, uh, as a statement, I think, by uh, Democrats and liberals uh, that they wanted to attack this pipeline, despite the fact that it had yeah. promise of showing uh, all of the check boxes as far as uh, reducing emissions was concerned, uh, to attack a pipeline uh, and, and not to take into consideration the economic realities of U.S. Uh, you know, security uh, for, uh, for energy, as well as uh, you know, the massive devolution of investment that has left Canada, which will have enormous consequences for Canadians, I think is both irresponsible and an example of what happens when ideology takes over principle. Well, let me just, let me just shift it to the country to the north. Uh, I saw something a couple of days ago, which seems to me quite farcical. Uh, they were announcing a new transportation policy for the next five years uh, that would put up such wonderful ingenuities as pop-up bicycle paths. But when the American president, on the very first day of his official moment in office, cancels a pipeline that has been subject to at least a decade of, of, of obstructions and cancellations and uh, agreements to go ahead and then cancellations again, uh, I, I, it's, it's the prime minister here, outside of partisanship. Mr. President, it's your first day. The world is full of crises, China, COVID, every other damn thing. And the first thing you do is to destroy an essential uh, ingredient of the major industry of this country. So, Mr. President, uh, I want to object and I want to keep objecting until I hear at least some substantial reason why you're doing it and why you're doing it so symbolically on your first day. Well, I think the American president has made it pretty clear that uh, this was an issue that he was going to continue with his predecessor, who for all intents and purposes, in my estimation, is really running the show. But if this was some kind of a decision made uh, to you know, send a signal uh, or perhaps uh, provide uh, you know, a SOP, uh, as it were, or payback for a constituency that supported you, you couldn't have picked a worse pipeline in which to make that statement, simply because by any logistical, uh, judicial, uh, and in fact, engineering perspective, this particular pipeline uh, was anything but the thing that uh, the green alarmists are concerned about. Quite to the contrary, uh, it was providing some of the cleanest oil uh, to a very much needed market. And of course, Mr. Biden, the President Biden, of course, made a decision. I note that while he was signing this, it wasn't lost on folks like myself who haven't commented much on the American uh, election, although I probably was tempted to do so many times. At one point, he stopped and the, 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 the signatures on these various things on the very first day, he didn't even know what he was signing. <laughs> Now that should suggest to people that this is uh, the way in which profound, distinct policies are now being judged. There's yeah. obviously a lot of actors behind the scenes. Uh, it's not the president. But I want to also know why our politicians, and I'm going to include, the, I am most certainly including the conservative politicians. They have almost in the entire representation is Western MPs, and we have a prime minister of Canada 
where were the Western MPs and where are they even now? Because this is huge. And why, you know, if, if it was some, some, some steel industry in Ontario, or, or God forbid in Quebec, uh, Mr. Trudeau would be out doing one of his famous dances. Where sure. are they? They're nowhere to be found because they're, they're the narrative of this country is that you can do without pipelines. You can do without your oil and gas sector. You can do without your agricultural sector because, of course, let's admit it. We'll talk about that later. Uh, the carbon taxes are crushing uh, farmers, yes, especially will. when it comes to the cost of drying grains and transportation. You're destroying the manufacturing sector. You've had many guests, including Jocelyn Benford here in Ontario, talked about uh, the devastating impact that uh, these carbon taxes are, are wreaking on most uh, business. So if you have nothing left at the end of the day, which to produce in a hosp in a hospitable country, uh, which uh, sparsely populated, the weather's terrible, uh, you know, and yet what once the envy of the world, where does that leave you? And it really does require us to understand why are all politicians sitting in the House of Commons today all reading from the same hymn book? Because it's a hymn book that's likely to lead us down a very dangerous path of unaffordability and economic ruin. It's already bringing us down that particular path, but I'm going to just stress because I think it needs to be called out a bit more than it has been that if, if there is to be some voice uh, for the energy producers and for the farmers I'm going to get to that as well uh, particularly out west but not exclusively then where are this, where is this cadre of conservative MPs and secondly why is the current leader Mr. O'Toole so comfortable more or less signing on to the ideology of Mr. Trudeau when it comes to this damnable carbon emissions farce. I don't know, Rex, but I understand what it has done to many of the provinces. When we at Canadians for, for Affordable Energy put out our report back in September, October, uh, pointing out that uh, the, the both carbon taxes, the first one, which Mr. Trudeau, breaking an election promise he only made 16 months ago, that he will increase carbon taxes from $50 a ton up to 170 a ton and then add a, a clean fuel yeah. standard, which is a misnomer. We have clean fuel in Canada. We've already achieved that. In case anyone hasn't known, we had, had violations of uh, clean air uh, regulations, which are very stringent in Canada in decades. Uh, but that aside, it would appear that it's uh, not, uh, it's something that's not lost on consumers, but certainly lost on our politicians who tend to think that it's okay to lard on these large in implications that will uh, devastate not only the industrial sector and heartland of Canada, but also damage consumers. But where do politicians get this perspective? Well, there's been no pushback. For the longest time, the reason I joined the Canadians for Affordable Energy, uh, from my days at Gas Buddy and tomorrow's GasPriceDay.com, and prior to that as an MP, consistent with the idea that it's important to protect consumers and to protect the uh, the attractiveness of our country, which is affordability. And you can't have that if you're going to layer on hundreds of dollars of taxes. It doesn't, it isn't certainly lost on those families, uh, mothers, on, you know, single mothers, uh, uh, smaller families, the Atlantic provinces who have said to the prime minister in a, in a rare demonstration of unity, please do not impose this clean fuel standard. We can't afford to have every worker in our provinces have to pay an extra thousand dollars a year just so you can, just so you can you know, Pose. bought in front of uh, international fora, uh, you know, with canapes and uh, swilling back Perrier and tell people how, puni how you're going to punish the nation. For me, as a politician, having spent 18 years there, this is unseemly. There was a time and a place where politicians would have pushed back on this and would have shown leaders with this kind of idea the door. But that doesn't seem to be the case either for Mr. O'Toole and certainly not for, uh, for the Prime Minister, uh, Justin Trudeau. Well, it is also very interesting. Uh, we're underlining obvious points, but they need the under line. And by the way, I'll just make one point. I want to confirm the absence of pushback. The absence of pushback is not only from the politicians. I've been kind of stranded in a lonely zone of wonder why the oil companies themselves over the last decade, they've been sheepish about the devastations that have been done. But leave that be. Is it not also interesting that in the year of COVID and a strangulated parliament, and a distribution of over $400 billion in, 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 in basically resource handouts, that the only taxes that we get introduced to, taxes during a, a depression, in terms of, of stores and, and, and businesses and commerce, is a carbon tax and a fuel standard. What are they thinking? Well, they're thinking uh, beyond what the limits of reason, and certainly beyond <laughs> the, the laws of uh, fundamentals. Perhaps it's all about 
being masters of meteorological masochism. I'm not sure. Uh, but what is motivating many of these is either absolute ignorance of what they're proposing. So it's one thing to come out and say, hey, we're going to meet the carbon target of uh, reducing uh, carbon yeah. emissions 30% below two be, you know, well before 2005. Now you're, you're going to go one step further and say, we're going to do what is physically fundamentally impossible and say we're going to eliminate all emissions by 2050. And to do that, uh, you know, there isn't a single serious person out there who says that you can achieve that in a country like this. Uh, Rex, you wrote this week about how cold this country is. How do you do that? Uh, what do you got to rely on windmills and a couple of solar panels? Uh, it really does request and require members of parliament and our leaders to finally take into consideration the reality of the proposals that they're putting forth. But the fact that liberals would only focus on climate change, uh, which is highly debatable, including the source, suggests that we are either looking for issues that we, we don't understand or that we can simply spend recklessly and with abandon in the hope that somehow something will stick and that we can bribe voters long enough to get them past November, past June, in order for them to elect a, a majority government. But uh, either way, uh, I've never seen anything like this unfold. Usually there was an accountability of the leadership and the policies in this country. People would hold their feet to the fire. I know I had mine held many times as I proposed a variety of private members' bills, including rebates for Canadians on energy. Uh, but I had to go up against a pretty strong opposition or a pretty strong government and a strong media, none of which exists today. It's all really... We're, you know, we're, we're drinking from the same dirty, unaffordable water. It's, it really is a club. I mean, can you think, <clears throat> excuse me, can you think of any other serious nation on earth? I mean, any, any, any established mature nation uh, that looks at the principal resource, not only of itself, but I've, I've not had to argue, I'm just making the obvious point that 21st century society or civilization, if you prefer the larger word, simply could not function. Nothing functions without energy. Yeah. And here we are in a providence or God-blessed uh, uh, country that has the most basic resource of the entire modern world, yeah. and we seem to be the only one that is dedicated to ruining one of the great gifts that nature or others have given us. What is this about? Well, we've been bequeathed an extraordinary standard of living that didn't happen by accident. Fossil oh. fuels got us there. But it's also the very thing that Canada can produce that can help save the world if we believe that the world is going to be suffering some kind of green Armageddon uh, coming up in the next eight or nine years. You know, it's not, uh, it's not lost on many of us when we think uh, Canada has problems selling not only its natural gas, but getting pipelines approved for the natural gas that could potentially stave off China, which of course got a freebie when it comes to the uh, Paris Climate Agreement, can continue to pollute right up until and increase its emissions right up until 2030. Uh, Canada could potentially send a lot more natural gas over there as an alternative than burning coal and bringing the planet to where they believe it will be that Armageddon. But we are prevented. We get no credit for this. In fact, we get no credit for the 2005 benchmark. Look, uh, I came from riding Pickering where we had nuclear reactors going back to 1970. We were the first country in North America and certainly almost around the world next to France that used commercial nuclear uh, as clean energy going back over half a century ago. And so I don't think we need a lesson on these things, but Canadians tend to take for granted. And I think that's key. We tend to underestimate, perhaps not even understand the great advances that have been done that have uh, given us not only our standard of living, but have turned this hostile territory that Voltaire referred to as a few acres of snow, quelques yeah. de neige, into the great dynamic enviable country that it was. All of that is at risk, and it's at risk because of our ignorance and our willingness to surrender to people yeah. who parade uh, as if they have some kind of solution and are you know, pushing at every turn the so-called climate emergency. It's minus 15 outside here in Toronto today. There's no climate emergency. There is, however, the need for natural gas to keep, uh, you know, everyone's place and, and, and household and business warm. Yeah, as, as again, you referred to the column, there were places hitting minus 51, and if we follow the Trudeau prescriptions, uh, they could look forward. We're going to shave off two degrees. Well, they could get to minus 53 if they're lucky. <laughs> I, I, this is a more general question. Is it because in the main, there are always pockets of, of, of different situation, but in the main, compared to, again, the countries of the world, we are so comfortable. We are so secure. We, we've leaped in a generation and a half. I remember being in Newfoundland in the 50s. Never mind hearing in the 50s what the people went through in the 40s and the 30s. 
But we've, we've just landed on a plateau of the greatest prosperity, security, mostly tranquil and peaceful. And therefore, we get careless and we get mindless of the advantages we haven't really earned, we've inherited, and therefore are kind of, you know, throwing them out the window. Yeah, it is uh, a significant degree of carelessness. And I'm not sure if it's because what was done 10, 20, and 30 years ago to, for instance, uh, bring the finances of this country in order, done at great cost uh, at the time, uh, but recognizing that you can't continue to spend money you don't have. But yet, you know, we are back to doing those things. It's almost as if we have a generation that's grown up with the belief that uh, let the good times roll and the things that got us here, the institutions, the, uh, the mechanisms, the sacrifice that got us here over the years. And I'm not just talking to those who've sacrificed in war, but all those who, yeah. you know, built a better country for us, um, you know, ensuring that we had, you know, sustainable social programs. So we, someone could maintain our roads, someone could maintain our schools, someone could maintain our hospitals. We are very, very carelessly putting all of that at risk here we are. in the belief that somehow we're doing something good for the planet. And I, I think it's, it's, it's rather twisted uh, and it's unfortunate. I think, however, the only reality, and I, I hate to say it, is that people are going to have to see a tough economic uh, downturn, the likes of which uh, I have never seen, but my father can certainly have, would have talked about in the 1930s yeah. when opening a cupboard with, that was bare was, uh, was, was a commonplace in Canada. And I, I suspect that uh, taking for granted what we have been given, what we have been bequeathed, what we have earned over the years uh, is something that is very hard, easy to lose, but very hard to bring back and win back. And by I'll, destroying I'll ask you this. resource sector, we're doing that. I'll ask you this as someone who has, as you've indicated, and as almost everybody knows anyway, uh, you have been in public life. You have been in the fora where these things get tossed back and forth. You also have been in the rooms off camera where people, where politicians actually say the hard things. Yeah. But now we've got, because of COVID, I, I, you know, I'm not going to put, put it all as a blame thing, but because we also had such a very slack parliament and an even, to my judgment, a slacker opposition, we've gone in one year to the expenditures of $400 billion from a promised balance budget of, at 2019. When this COVID lifts, if, if it should lift, and we do a proper inventory of how much the economy, the businesses, small and large, and the job have been savaged, and it's a, it's a world phenomenon as well. Yes. And if, therefore, the financial parameters, ugly word, the, the financial relief of low interest disappears, how, how treacherous a terrain are we in at this present moment? Once this thing lifts and we see the balance sheets and we see uh, the full inventory of what has been sacrificed during this year and a half economically. Well, that's a very tall order in terms of trying to sift through yeah, it. it but I think, you know, higher energy costs, higher utility costs, higher food costs, Many of those things, the result of, uh, of an arbitrary decision to drive up prices to make things unaffordable for people, I think is the first. But what happens in the circumstance where the bondholders say, yeah. well, not only is the federal national debt at $1.2 trillion or whatever numbers, what about the provincial balance sheets? Yeah. You know, my province here in Ontario having the highest uh, uh, non-sovereign debt of any jurisdiction in the world. What happens in the circumstance in an environment where 10% of your economy doesn't get back on, where manufacturers can't come up, where oil companies and natural gas, uh, which has been our number one export, our number one by far, isn't able to get up running uh, properly again, and they're subject to the same kind of blockages, not just the political ones by, you know, errant politicians, but also the ones that we saw physically just before we went into this particular pandemic. What happens when food prices double and triple and quadruple over the next 10 years? And when the bondholders, of course, say, no, your 1.75% mortgage rate is far too low and not consistent with uh, the level of debt. Perhaps it's time for three and 4%. How many people will then be in difficulty? How many people will find themselves in what I remember as a young youngster working for Pierre Elliott Trudeau, working for his housing minister, Paul Cosgrove, when we hit dire straits and see 21 and 22% interest rates. If those things happen, and I suspect that they're probably, unless we're dealing with some kind of wacky monetary policy, uh, we may very well be in a situation which will take decades to get us out of, and in which hardship will become more commonplace than anything we've experienced in this generation. I know in certain ways this is a repeat or a paraphrase of what I've already asked, but 
It's a genuine puzzlement and it needs more exploration. Where are the contending voices, not only the opposition, but within the press itself? Where's someone saying, you know, this, we may understand the necessity of so much that has been done in this last peculiar year because of the pandemic, but, but it, it, it's laying traps for the future. And if, if we can fault ourselves for not having prepared for a pandemic, we do know that there's an economic uh, struggle of the darkest kind about to face us on employment of vast levels, industries lost, hospitality industry must be devastated. Who's thinking and who's saying, putting out the questions, for God's sake, are you looking at this? Do you have some people working in a serious manner on it? It seems there's like, like a cloud of apathy or complacency. Let's just drift along and things will be fine. Yeah, you have a mentality, I think, that has pervaded not just media, but well, all opinion leaders for that intents and purpose. I don't want to be, I don't want to generalize and broad brush, but the idea that the only way in which you can be successful is through government procurement or government subsidies or the increase of taxation or the paying of carpet credits. All of these things do not suggest to me that we have a plan or a path to growth, to restarting this economy. You know, as a kid growing up with old junk boxes, uh, cars that uh, shouldn't have been on the road, and many of my friends will know that, you know, it's as if we've decided to uh, run the battery down on the vehicle. It doesn't really matter what we do to try yeah, to get the engine yeah. going. It's a good analogy. The battery to kickstart the economy. We're in very serious trouble. And I, uh, nobody is taking the long view. Heck, we don't even have a national federal budget. We haven't had one in two years. I've never I know. seen a circumstance like that. It didn't happen in the Second World War. It didn't happen during the FLQ crisis. It didn't happen in 1981 when we had the massive economic meltdown. It didn't happen in the 1987, 1990 period. And it certainly didn't happen in 2008, 2009, the last time we had the, the global economic recession. So why do we not have one now? And I think it's because they are hiding whatever information they can from Canadians. Because once it is understood just how serious a situation our country finds itself, it will shock. And it will cause, I think, a significant reassessment of the priorities that Canadians have had. We've been allowing ourselves to walk down this path of climate emergency, when in fact the real emergency, the real crisis, yeah. is in face. Well, this is a toy shop government, in my opinion. I'm not going to yes, drag so you into, into that. I want to go to the other, not to the other, to one more thing uh, you've already alluded to. And I, even in my pathetic understanding of these things, even I've had some acquaintance with it. I've been out west a number of times and had some meetings, or I've spoken at some meetings with people in the agricultural industry. Go back to the farmers here. There's a word, incidentally, you don't hear a lot on any of the national news. I mean, it's really quite amazing. I'm going to digress for a second. Yeah. Really quite amazing how many things you do hear on a national newscast. We'll hear about the latest Mandalorian scandal, I am sure. But, you know, if the fuel prices are putting grain handlers in, in some trouble, if the carbon tax is upsetting three quarters of the Western population, I mean, there's so many things not even touched. But on the impact of fuel standard carbon tax on the farmers of this country. Again, you've dealt with it many times, both in your profession and in, in, your, in your feed. Just give me an outline of that. Well, farmers aren't rebated like Canadians. Uh, in the I know, provinces. it's insane. So, yeah, so whatever you do, it's, uh, it's, it's on you. And I don't know of many farmers who can take, as they are today at $30 a ton, paying up to one fifth of the cost of drying their grain is now carbon tax. And if that weren't enough, uh, CNCP has given them notice that they now have to pay for the increase in diesel prices. So think about <laughs> it. I'm now drying my grain for a period of time. It's going to cost me $100,000. Of that $100,000, it's costing me $20,000 just, just in carbon taxes. Uh, none of that, again, is rebated. What's more interesting is that Mr. Trudeau, with his move from what today is today $30 a ton to $170 a ton, it now means that the, those farmers are going to have to pay 5.2 times more, which means that 20,000 becomes 100,000. Effectively, the cost of the carbon tax itself, unrebated, will displace the actual uh, the cost all of the other products the, in that. It's so also the cost long, of the fuel. Yeah. I, I don't know how a farmer is going to stay in business. Are we going to, like our battery, our EV revolution, we're going to rely on China to build our all of our batteries to run our EVs? Are we going to now ask China to produce uh, you know, our, our, our wheat, our grain that we need. I mean, to me, 
it, you know, it, 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 it's an example of where this federal government never looked before it left. And I can tell you, on the clean fuel standard, which doesn't yet apply to natural gas and propane, only to gasoline, we found very clearly that the federal government did not know the cost benefit of what it was proposing. In fact, it did not take into account that for every dollar of so-called environmental benefit that everybody wants to be on in favor, of, yeah, yeah, yeah. it costs $6. So it really took away the intent, the purpose, and the support for those things. So now, so it's one thing you can be in Eastern Canada and say, I don't care that Line 5 Enbridge is going to close down and I'll have no gasoline potentially in three months because of the shenanigans of Democrats in Michigan and their friends in, in, in now in Washington. I can put that all aside. What am I going to do when I have no grain or when I have to import my product. What do I do when I can't afford the very things that it needs? And you don't have to take convince people very much, Rex. They simply go to the grocery store and they see price of few food moving up 10, 15 percent a year, and none of that is rebated. So I guess what it really comes down to is you're going to destroy the oil sector, the energy sector. You're going to destroy the resource sector, the agricultural sector, and as I mentioned earlier, you've hobbled the manufacturing sector in Ontario with the kind of experimentations that were undertaken by Gerald Butts. Yeah, actually, uh, actually Wynn, that's back a, ten years ago on hydro. I think I'm glad you brought it up. I wasn't going to get to it, but I think we need a reminder on that. Uh, again, not it's not that the attention span is so short these days; it's <laughs> that there's such a cloud of damn news, and the news keeps shifting. Just for, just just recall a little bit. What was the what was the end result of, of the great embrace of the full green agenda in Ontario? I remember, for example, uh, during Kathleen Wynne's, Wynne's tenure, that she was giving out subsidies to the poorest people of Ontario who couldn't pay their hydro bills because the taxes she introduced made the hydro bills unaffordable. Give me yeah, a, a recount of the experiment <laughs> in Ontario. So the Green Energy Act proposed by some wonderful folks that uh, thought it would be a great idea to take a province that had the lowest energy rates, arguably in all of North America, a real attraction that we had uh, invested in many years ago. We thought it'd be a great idea to say, well, let's bring in and introduce windmills and solar and other forms of renewables force them as part of the base load. In other words, it doesn't matter what you're producing. You have to compensate them as if they're part of the, uh, the program. Yeah. And it would cost maybe 1% increase in hydro rates. And we ah. would, by the way, get 50,000 jobs here in Ontario. I know, I remember that. 10 years later, 30,000 net jobs were lost in the manufacturing sector. The cost has tripled, not doubled, tripled. I say tri you can see doubled, so it's gone from six to eight cents a kilowatt hour all the way up to 12, 14, and in some instances, 20 to 21 cents. We are in this province incurring a $6.5 billion annual debt that's being put on the public for years to come to shield people from that extra increase that we should have had as a result of, uh, of overpaying uh, and giving generous long multi-year contracts uh, to these uh, windmill and uh, solar organizations. Many of them have strong connections to my former party. But beyond that, we're also looking at, uh, you know, uh, selling a lot of this spillover, this, this extra yeah. energy that we're creating, costing us 28, 29 cents a kilowatt hour. But because we have to compensate these new renewables, we're selling it to Michigan for one cent. Sometimes we're actually paying them to take it off our hands. Now that's not hydro doing that. That's of course the, those who are involved with the trade itself. But it does suggest to me that there is something fundamentally wrong, and it's really a uh, you know an important reminder when people are talking about climate green policies, go no further than Ontario and to see how people on fixed incomes. Yeah. are managing under the circumstance because and i've said, said this to other people you really want to deal with what uh, green green policies are all about ask people to pull out their hydro bill and compare to what they were paying 10 years ago and no well, reason for it at all yeah well ontario was was the controlled experiment as you said the highest substandard na sub sovereign national debt in the entire world and the sages uh, who brought that uh, that classic episode of wisdom to ontario migrated uh -huh. very quickly to ottawa and became, and I use the term loosely, the brain trust for the Trudeau administration. <laughs> uh, another, another big uh, big point, and it is a big point, you're getting signals, uh, not only in this country, but I want to speak only of this country, that because of the anxieties and, and the, the necessary concentration on COVID, uh, this is a very personal thing if people are experiencing it. Their minds, in other words, are elsewhere, and justifiably so. But we're hearing that and I'm seeing it from certain of the green organizations quite blatantly, 
not quite as blatant for Mr. Trudeau, but they're attempting to leverage the atmospherics and the ethos and the top-down controls wrought by a, a medical epidemic yep. into yep. mutating it into, oh, now we've seen how to handle an emergency. Let's go to green shift and take yep. the same structures. Are they manipulating the COVID crisis to get back to their obsession with apocalyptic global warming? Well, it's command and control. You, know, you have a government that said they could actually run without parliament, give them two year blank well, checks. Well, they, they, they have run without they parliament. Want. But this is really a question of where in this period of time, a crisis has been used, a veritable crisis has been used to, as it were, uh, do things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do in normal circumstances. It's as if we've had someone has declared the former War Measures Act yeah. and put it in yeah. place, and now simply said, well, we're going to transpose that on what we know to be uh, a fake crisis. Uh, fake, I say, because we don't have exact exacting science on this, and I'm not going to get into debates with people, no. scientists who are trying to be politicians or politicians trying to be scientists. Uh, I see it from both sides. I'm married to a scientist. I hear of this all the time. But the reality, I think, for many uh, is that what we have seen uh, and what we are about to see in terms of build back better, resilient recovery, uh, you know, these things are opportunities used by opportunists to hijack an agenda uh, for their own gain. I mean, make no mistake about it. Those organizations that are advocating this are either got their themselves definitely connected to government in terms of subsidies, grants. Yeah. Or, you know, I see the data being ripped out, ripped out of various you know, universities across the country, always one-sided. But beyond that, uh, are we now looking at a circumstance where under the climate, the guise of climate crisis, you're able to justify just about everything yeah. and anything, things that would be considered absolutely horrendous and would be challenged, not just by the media, but by politicians in the past. So yes, I think it's been used for that reason, uh, but I guess it's perfectly in line with uh, our good friend uh, in the Prince, uh, Niccolo Machiavelli, when he said uh, the end truly does in fact justify the means. Yeah. The means is there, the end has just changed. That's all they've done. Yes, and again, I'm going back to the earlier part. <clears throat> we have such feeble opposition representation. I mean, Jagmeet Singh has basically become a Siamese with Mr. Trudeau. The Green Party, well, we, well, insofar as it can be called a party, it's actually a rump, uh, are, are there as well. Uh, we have separatists, well, they're not concerned with the future of the country as a whole. And the Conservatives, apart from one or two stellar performances, and you know what I mean, uh, they're so, so damn obliging. We could walk into this thing, this the manipulation, and it is the opportunistic uh, strategic utility of the COVID crisis to continue on to a non-crisis, but one which has been propagandized for the last 20 years. And as you point out, with, with a very one-dimensional presentation in almost all the major media of the world, any criticism of yep. the dogmas, and I'm using that word correctly, the dogmas of global warming, just does not get airtime. No, it doesn't get airtime. It's considered, uh, you know, impolitic. Uh, it's not trendy. It's not the fad. It's not the soup du jour. Uh, the fact is that what we're seeing here is a control of, of, of ideas and that people yeah. have, are not allowed to think openly, uh, to think, you know, it, that there could be alternatives. Uh, the reality, I think, though, and we've talked about this at great length, is what happens when people then realize that despite all of this, you know, talk and, and, and lecture and indoctrination. What happens when at the end of all of this, you have nothing to show yeah. for it? What if we are in fact following into the agenda of the World Economic Forum with, you'll have no property and you'll love it. You won't eat meat and you'll love it. <laughs> a good example of that. If we are thinking that the economic systems that have brought us to this point and the sacrifices I mentioned earlier are meaningless, then we truly are setting ourselves on a path uh, towards a reality that I think many people have never thought they would ever have to experience. And uh, like a bucket of cold ice on your head, I think it's coming. Unfortunately, it'll be because so many thought and were told otherwise. And uh, I would have hoped that uh, you, we would see more leaders, opinion leaders, uh, take a very differing perspective. But I think they will have plenty of followers in the next six or seven months. You know, Rex, it wasn't lost on me in December that uh, in speaking to many people I know from my days as a member of parliament, um, money marts, uh, check cashing organizations right across the country had never seen such brisk business. Yeah, yeah. People are desperate. And if we are going to continue to have a deaf ear 
to the plight of Canadians, more and more who are joining the lines of the dispossessed, uh, those who are disenfranchised, who have no voice, uh, then we are in, in, in a state of revolution in okay. this country in the sense that we will see some change and it will be it will be very upsetting uh, to the uh, to the elite who thinks otherwise and are prepared to uh, indoctrinate otherwise. And that's, that's I had a lot more, but I'm going to stop right now. But that, that's a chill message, but it's an extremely necessary one. I'm not flattering you and I'm not, you know, going up to you. It's too bad you're not in the damn parliament. Uh, I will, if, if your patience uh, can allow it, uh, come back to you in a couple of weeks because there's a whole lot more yet to be discussed. But I think on this, and again, no flattery, uh, you're, you're a necessary voice. And I thank you very much for joining me. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me, Rex. Dan, that was first class. And again, I'm not bullshitting you. It really was. No, no. I, uh, I think Rex you do it very well. Before. I, uh, you know, Rex, uh, I, uh, in 1981, my father lost his shirt in the, in the construction industry, yeah. um, building homes in Oshawa. Uh, I worked for Paul Cosgrove, happened to be a long lost friend of his. And Paul Cosgrove was the Minister of Housing when people I were remember. walking into our office throwing their keys in at 24% interest rates. I experienced that viscerally and it hadn't been for that experience when my family had lost everything. Uh, and a lot of people lost everything. So I'm not saying it's about me, but no, it's not. here's the contract. And I remember to the day talking to Paul and saying, Mr. Cosgrove, my dad's losing his shirt because of your government's policies of borrowing too much money. Yeah. You got the you got the you got the constitution right. You sure as hell got the economy wrong. Yeah, yeah. And he didn't get it. He didn't understand it until he actually oh. lost the election in 1984. So. Well, I, I my friend way back, 19 percent interest rate when he bought his first house to have his first kid. Uh, you know, it, that only can happen again. And with listen, I, I obviously again, uh, I was quite serious. I, I'm going to plague you one more time. We'll probably get this on sometime yeah, yeah, yeah. within the next seven days. I will either me or Aaron. Yeah, we'll alert you to it, and from from your end of the the scale, uh, you give it a shove as well. It'll take us a while to kind of merge out of the the suspension from COVID, but I I hope to get it back with some, if you give this term, with, with yeah. some energy from here on in. Listen, thank you very much. It was great to be here, and and a pleasure uh, and an you, honor. I uh, you know, no, it's no fucking years. honor. I assure yeah. you of that. <laughs> I, I, oh, used to, I, I used to always make sure that I didn't see you, I didn't have you talking about me at some, <laughs> no, at some point see me see every good. night. <laughs> you were too good. Now that's first class, and I will be talking to Tim and let him know again. It, it really was. That's, that's and and say, hello to your si say hello to your sister for me. She was at St. James, this is the uh, young, the little school up, up the street from where I used to live when I was MP in Ajax. Oh, God damn. Okay. <laughs> well, Aaron's mom. Oh, and I had no God. idea until a few minutes ago. Yeah, no, that's Jude. Uh, she's coming in here over the weekend. She, she only, it's only same one in the family, but you probably figured that out. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm going to let world. you go. Thanks, my friend. Thanks. Take care. Thanks. We'll talk soon, Rex. Bye-bye. Yep.